this like every week but would you like to ride to church with me oh come on mrs edwards you'll like my church we have some hot music it may not be what you're bumping at all but it's hot we get down what do you say mrs edwards oh i suppose I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. Hi All right, homework. We just got here. Good morning, everyone. 
Morning. Morning. Welcome to the Odyssey. I think everybody knows me. If you don't, my name is Jennifer. I'm one of the lead team people here. And basically what the lead team does is we get with PR every week and we plan out the service and the music like you just heard. And we're going to have some awesome music later on. We were having rehearsal yesterday with these three and I was almost in tears. So I'm really looking forward to it. If it is your first time here, this is the part where I get to tell you the rest of you can take a nap for about 30 seconds. There are green connection cards in the chairs in front of you. Fill them out. Let put them in the basket um, by the door when we pass the tithing basket, and that way we can stay connected to you. I hope everybody got the weekly email update if you had email because we used a new service, and it looks a lot of fun, and it looks like it's going to be able to make our email updates more interactive. So for me as a tech person, I'm like all excited about it. So, but we are here today. We are wrapping up our Abundant Life service sermon series. And we are excited that we're here and wrapping it up. And um, But before we do that, we actually have a lot going on. We always do. Later this afternoon, we have a baccalaureate graduation service. Baccalaureate is one of those really long words that only spell check knows how to spell. But basically what it is is a graduation service for all of the high school seniors in the area and all the community of churches. You've heard us use the term Southeast Sussex Ministerium before. Um, we actually just had a meeting about two weeks ago where we voted to change it to a more friendly name called the Christian Council of Churches. We're still the same thing, a group of churches. Um, and we are putting on a graduation service today at 2 p.m. at Indian River High School. If we'd like everybody to come out, whether you have a graduate or not, and help celebrate, we don't have any graduates in our church this year. Next year, we will have three, hopefully more, um, inc including Julie, graduating from high school. But we are taking part. You're gonna, if you show up, you'll see me there. You'll see PR there. Um, he's not speaking, so don't worry. It's not going to take forever. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> but uh, we do want you to come out tonight at 2 p.m. at Indian River. And if you don't know where the high school is, get up with me on the directions. Then next week, Second Wind Ministries, um, we are, it's, it's Memorial Day weekend. We're going to do something so special to celebrate Memorial Day. And then we are going to get off the stage and turn everything over to Tom and Debbie Slaughter. So if you come every week and you've been coming for a while and you get sick of seeing the same people up here week after week, come next week because we won't be up here. <laughs> um, they have an amazing testimony. They have an amazing way they do service with music and testimony and you've heard PR talk about who they are. So we just invite you to come out. We're really excited to welcome them here. And then immediately following that, we have our own Odyssey Church Gourmet Grill Chefs that will be making hamburgers and hot dogs. And we're gonna have a picnic for Memorial Day. I should have mentioned that once the service next week, there's one service at 10 a.m. So if you normally come for this service at 9.30, you show up, you'll be fine, you'll be early. If you come up, for 11.15, you'll be late. But we do want you to come and join up, and what we need you to do is to bring a side dish or a dessert. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby so you can see what other people have signed up to bring. You don't have to make a lot. We just say make enough for maybe six or eight people, plus Pastor Rob. So actually make a lot, because he can eat. Um, and then we're just gonna kind of celebrate Memorial Day with our church family, so. But before we continue on, like I said, we're wrapping up the Abundant Life Sermon Series, and I was praying to God about what I wanted to say for the opening, and I asked him for a verse. I do this all the time. If you've seen you see, I usually talk a verse. And he kept giving me this verse about the abundant life, and it's found in Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. Um, and if you don't know who Jeremiah was, he was an Old Testament prophet, and he lived in a time actually not entirely dissimilar to the times we're living in now. There was a lot of chaos going on in the world, a lot of wars being fought, a lot of battles being fought. The big temple that they built in Jerusalem was actually fallen. And in the midst of all this chaos, Jeremiah looked to God and he asked him, what do I do? Like, where, what's going on? And so Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 14 says this. For know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end, up your, I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again. 
to your own land. And I just thought it was really fitting for how we're wrapping up the sermon series on the abundant life. And we've been talking about how to live an abundant life in Jesus. And that may be just one of the easiest ways. And I also love that that's one of the cool things about your Bible. You just open it up, pray to God, say, show me what you want me to show you. And he will show you what he needs to do. So today, as we go forth, I want you to remember that no matter what's going on in your life, good or bad, God knows what's going to happen to you. You are in his arms. You are protected. And with that, would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today knowing that you know what's going on in our lives, knowing you know what we need, and knowing that you will always provide for us in bad and good. And may we remember to always celebrate and thank you. And remember that at the end of the day, to keep our eyes fixed on you and your word. Be with us today as we worship in your name, as we sing your praises, as Pastor Rob delivers your message. And may we just grow to be closer to you. And it's in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And now I'm going to get off the stage and turn it back over to our youth team today for the music. team up here this morning. I think they did a wonderful job. And you like the way we changed the words to I'm a believer? Yes. That, uh, we have seen the Christ and he is the ever living Christ. And uh, now I'm a believer and I don't think I could ever turn my way away from this face. So we just thank you this morning for being here. Uh, we'll let you know a couple things. Next week we will I keep saying this because if you're like me, you forget. Uh, next week, we only have one service. starts at 10 o'clock. Tom and Debbie Slaughter will be here. Tom and Debbie have a wonderful ministry. They sing Southern Gospel music, but they, uh, Tom preaches. Debbie is a 9-11 survivor and a cancer survivor, so that there's just great testimony there. And we just ask you all to come out and see that. And then, uh, if you like me, uh, my favorite two four-letter words put together are free food. So if you guys want to come out and have some free food, we're going to have a little picnic to celebrate Memorial Day. Next week is a really special day. Not only have Tom Slaughter, not only is it the week we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend, but it's also the day of Pentecost. It is the day that we celebrate the birthday of the church. And then the next week, we will have two services as well. Uh, we have Crash is going to come invade. The Odyssey Crash is the youth ministry promotion view, and they're one of the largest, one of the most well-organized youth ministries in this area. And you're going to be able to see how uh, teen ministry has changed the lives of some of the people in our very own area, including my daughter, who is leaving in about two months to go to Costa Rica uh, for a one-year mission trip down there. So uh, I'm just looking forward to what we're going to be able to see and what we can see done as we start our own youth ministry in the church. And then on June 7th, we're going to start a new sermon series called How to Be Rich. And that's a four-part series. And what you may not know is there may be people in here right now today that are already rich. You might be rich and not even know that you're rich because you don't know how to be rich. So we're hoping to teach you how to be rich through a sermon series that changed my life years ago. With the sermon series that allowed me to be able to go as long as I have without a paycheck and be able to do what we do here at the Odyssey. So... Very important. It was life-changing to me. I hope it's life-changing to you as well. And I want you to keep this in mind. As we go to our tithes and offerings, and I'm just going to leave the basket up here. You can put it in as you leave. There's a, uh, you know, we do have to pay our bills here. So I, I don't want to take that lightly. But the Odyssey Church never wants something from you. We want something for you. And God's Word is the same way. He doesn't teach us to do these things because He wants something from us. I mean, let's face facts. God owns everything anyway. He says He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He created the earth and owns everything on it. Everything we have from Him is a gift. He wants something for you, not something from you. And so do we. So that's why we've gone through this budget series, and then we're going to teach you how to be rich. But uh, please, on your way out, if God leads you, it is a free will offering. Uh, just drop it in a basket. As you leave. Let me pray for you as we begin to go to the Word of God this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those that are here this morning. And Lord, we thank you to just be able to come into your house. We forget just the, 
privilege that we have here in the United States. There's people all around the world today that are worshiping you in secret and private because they fear for their life. And yet, in the country that has the greatest uh, abundance, in the country where we have the greatest freedom, people stay home and don't come because they feel that there's not a need to. Lord, we have been so blessed in this world. Let us see that. Let us see that you're behind the scenes, that you're taking care of us day in and day out. Even when our circumstances look bleak, you're still there with us. Father, we praise you and we thank you. And Whatever gifts are given today, Lord, we just ask that you will multiply them, that you would use them for your glory. And Father, we just ask that as I come to give your message, Lord, that you would speak through me. That they be your words and not my words. Father, we praise you and thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. same time trying to make the experience so good that you will want to come back. In fact, you want to come back and bring a friend with you. We want to be a church that makes disciples, that make disciples, that make disciples. We keep on making disciples until Christ comes back to get his church. And if you sort of enjoyed your experience here so far this morning, we have tried really hard to make it easy for you to come back next week and invite people to come with you because you don't have to tell them that you're coming to church. You just tell them we're going to go to a Memorial Day picnic and there's going to be some music there. There's going to be some concert maybe. You've got to speak a little bit. And uh, one of the ways that uh, I've been in churches in the past and we built the church is simply by offering people food because they may not want to come to church but they'll certainly come out to eat and hopefully when they get here you're going to see uh, that God truly is this God. This Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is. And, and you know what? We celebrate as a family. You're going to hear a little bit about that today. We want to celebrate next weekend as the Odyssey Church family. So as Jennifer said, today we're finishing up in a series we're calling The Abundant Life. Uh, we're going to be in the last part of a six-part series. And if you're new to the church, we've been in this series for a while. Uh, but don't worry, each lesson stands on its own. Uh, if you like today's lesson or maybe you're curious about lessons in the past or you missed a lesson, uh, you can always go to our website, www.theodysseychurch.com, and they'll be there forever for free for as long as you have internet and electricity and a device to watch them on. So anyways, a series is where we just take a topic and we just talk about it until you're tired of hearing about it. And uh, I'm tired of talking about it. But, and that's not really true. What, what we know is what you repeat, you remember. You know, if, if we don't take the Word of God with us when we leave, if we leave and we forget about it and we don't apply it to our lives, it doesn't do us any good. So our hope is that when we take a topic like this, that you remember it, and that you're able to take it with you, and that you will reply, apply it to your life. And, and you know, sometimes I forget to do that. Sometimes uh, these messages are good for me because they're a refresher. I don't always live the more abundant life because I have to be reminded of some of the things that are in God's Word. Now, what we've been talking about Sunday mornings are messages that I've been studying most of my life, either in a secular form or a biblical form. The problem is, like I said, is I don't always remember it. I have to be refreshed, so they're always good to hear again. But if you listen to most motivational speakers, if you listen to most people who are telling and, and get, encouraging people to live their lives, whether they realize it or not, most of the principles they talk about are found in God's Word. 
even if you're talking to a, a listening to a secular motivational speaker, they use the principles that are found in God's word because God's word does not come back void whether you believe in him or not. So the very principles that we're studying are used, and sometimes we don't even know they come from God's word. The principle which you improve, if you apply to your life is going to help you live life and live it more abundantly in this world. But as the authors of scriptures tell us, as the prophets and, and uh, the apostles and Jesus said, enough said, you may live abundantly more in this world, but if you don't believe Jesus is who he says he is, then you will be in a place of eternal torment, a place that we call hell. So today we're going to sort of talk about how to have this more abundant, like this new thing that we talked about in the very first message. What does it mean to live the more abundant life? I think the first thing we have to do is describe what it is and define what it means to live the more abundant life. And the reason we need to do that is because I know, and maybe you know, and if you don't know them personally, maybe you see them on TV, people who have a ton of abundance, they have a popularity, they have power, they have prestige, have all of these things that the world would say they should be living abundant life, but I see them and they're not living life and living more abundantly. In fact, some of the people that I know that are the people that have the most abundance are some of the most miserable, anxious, worried people I've ever met. Somebody once told me who was a very wealthy man, he told me the easy part was getting my wealth. <laughs> what I worry about now is losing my wealth. He said he worked harder at keeping what he had than he ever worked to get what he had. And I don't think he was living a more abundant life. So the first thing we need to do is define what the abundant life is. I think one of the problems is we sometimes confuse abundance with abundant. Abundance, according to the dictionary, is, is, a, is, a, is a noun. It's something we have. But abundant is described as an adjective. It's something that's descriptive. It's something that we become. So abundance is something we have. Abund, ab, abundant is something we become. So let's suppose for a minute that I can give you a life, and I can guarantee you that in that life like you would have joy that's greater than any joy that you've ever experienced before, a blessedness, that is, that is this joy that is happiness in its fullest uh, measure, that you would have an assurance that no matter what you were going through would be handled in the end, that you would have an assurance that not only when you left this life, you'd go into the next life and spend eternity with God, if you could have all those things, don't you think you'd be living life and living abundantly? And if I could offer you such things, don't you think you'd say yes to it? Because you knew that if you had peace and joy, I know if I had peace and joy and hope, no matter what my circumstances were, no matter how much money I had, no matter how much money I didn't have, how much happiness or, or how many abundant things I had or didn't have, if I had those things, I could live life and live it more abundantly. But of course, I can't offer you those things. I don't have it in my power to offer you those things. But Jesus Christ, who is God, can offer you those things. In fact, he says, that's the reason that I came. In John 10, 10 of the scriptures, he tells us, he says, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So even though I can't offer you those things, Jesus says he can. Jesus offers this abundant life. Not only by his sacrificial death on the cross, but also by his teachings recorded by his apostles and by their friends. Uh, one, of, one of the, the stories of his life, the Gospel of Luke, and then that's the story of his life here on earth, and then the story of his life and what he does in his power from heaven is called the book of Acts. He was a doctor according to his brothers, James and Jude. All these authors of the Bible, even Jesus himself, says that Jesus offers us this abundant life. Now, there are so many principles that are found in God's Word that there's no way just to go through them in just a couple of weeks. I mean, even if we were to take the year, we couldn't describe all the principles that are in God's Word that would give us this abundant life. That's why you need to have a Bible of your own, and you need to read it during the week, not just on Sundays. And if you don't have one, uh, we've got, I think we've got one left up here. Don't worry about it. Take it with you when you leave. And uh, we got more coming in next week. So hopefully by every time everybody comes in next week, we'll have more 
on the shelf. But take it with you and read it. Even if you start out just reading it five minutes a day, before long, if you're like me, that's what I said I was going to read it five minutes a day, but I became so engrossed in it that uh, before long I was spending much more time than that. And I could see that the life-changing principles God's Word had applied to my life would give me life and let me live it more abundantly. Now we started this series by saying God wants to do a new thing in our life. And we've come expecting God to do these great things. As a friend of mine once said, a uh, guy by the name of Barry Townsend, he said, if you don't come to church expecting God to do something, why would you come to church? If you don't expect that God to come to church and see God, why would you come? So we come to church expecting God to do these great things in our life. He wants to do a new thing. He's already planned it out for us according to the scriptures, as Jennifer read to us this morning from Jeremiah 29, 11. I don't know where you're at in your life right now. You know, I, I don't know what's going on. Maybe you're having some trouble in your finances. Well, I believe God wants to do a new thing in your finances. Maybe you're having some troubles in your relationship. I believe God wants to do a new thing in your relationship. Whatever it is in your life where you need a new thing, I believe God desires, God wants to do this new thing for you. But the hard part sometimes is we have to do our part too. God has this desire. He wants to do it. But until we reach out and say, okay, God, we know you're sovereign. You're going to take this over, but I'm going to do my part as well. God just waits for us to come to him. Because he cares way too much about eternal things than he does our material things. He, he cares more about those things that are going to last forever than those things that are going to pass away. God's greatest desire is that he's going to do this new thing. And this new thing is not just going to last for your lifetime here. It's going to last all the way in eternity. God's greatest desire, according to the scripture, his greatest desire is that you commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ by simple faith and put your trust in him and surrender all you have to his will. And there are not a lot of problems sometimes. Because words like surrender and obedience and commitment are words we don't like to use. We don't like to hear. We certainly don't like to apply to our life. Because that means we're allowing somebody else to direct us to the places we go and the places uh, and the things that we do. And we like to do the things we like to do and go to the places we like to go and say the things we want to say. But what if you knew the person who was directing you to these places always had your best interest in mind. That, that no matter where they took you, they always would take you to the place that they knew was best for you. I think if you believe that, then you wouldn't have a problem following whoever it was that was going to lead you to a better place. And that's where faith comes in. The scripture tells us over and over again how much God loves us, how much he desires for us to have this abundant life. But few of us truly trust him enough to allow him to do that. And, and, it, and it seems like such an easy thing to do, except through the last five weeks we've seen it, it's not quite as easy. It takes some work on our part. So today we're going to sort of end the series where we begin. God wants to do a new thing in your life. And that new thing is going to lead to an everlasting life, an eternal life of more abundance. And I want to tell you about the new things that God desires for your life. But not just for your life here on earth, for your life all the way into eternity with Him. Now, it's amazing to me when I look at Scripture. I'm a very analytical person, so sometimes faith comes hard to analytical people because we want eyes, eyes, teeth, cross, we want the proof. But if, when you start studying the Scriptures, you see how real they really are. Isaiah, which was a prophet over 2,700 years ago, predicted all these things. It's where the, the text came from our first message. It says, but forget all of that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And in the context of what... Isaiah wrote about it. If you start reading in chapter 43, it, it, the text becomes, it just becomes alive. It becomes amazing. Don't be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I says, don't be afraid of anything, because I have paid the price for your freedom. In verse 2, he says, I'll be with you through the deep waters, and I won't let you drown. And I don't know about any of you. Any of you feel like you're in deep water anyway? 
feel like maybe the war is over their head and maybe you're having a problem in your relationship and you just feel like like it, it, it's so far up. I don't think I can get through it. it maybe it's your finances and you're drowning in debt. Maybe it, it, it's something else. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a, a desire that you had and you know that it's not a godly desire. And you just feel like you're drowning. Maybe it's your job and you're in over your head. God says, don't worry. I'll be with you through these rough waters. I will not let you drown. He said, when you, he said, when you go through the fire, I'll be with you and I won't let you get burned up. And I don't know about you, I've been through some fires in my life. I know there's people in here that are going through fires. People that are going through the fires and the tribulation of financial problems. People who are going through the, the fires of health problems with people they love. People that, that are going through fires in their relationship. All these things are going on in their life and they feel like they're going to get burned up. And God says, ah, you may get burned, but you're never going to get burned up. Verse 3, God says, I'm your Savior. In verse 4, He says, you're precious to me. He says, I honor you. Isn't that amazing? And then he said, you honor me, and I love you. I mean, can you imagine this? As, as I read this and think about it, what are we? But a speck. God created an infinite universe. He's created everything seen and unseen. We have this Hubble telescope that keeps going farther out, and the universe never ends. And we keep finding new things. And this God who created all that says, I care about you individually on this little speck of dirt in the middle of the universe. And you're on it. I care about you. And I honor you. And I love you. I mean, how amazing is that? Verse 7, God says, Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. I created them. God creates each one of us, and he gives us a purpose. Our purpose is to glorify him. Verse 13 says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. Verse 14, he says, I'm your redeemer. And then God goes on. He lists some of the things that he'd done for the Israelites over the years. Delivered them from bondage. Delivered them from slavery. All these things. And, then, and, and, and I want you to know, he's talking to the Israelites. But he had not been in church before. You don't know why I'm a church... Israelites are simply a picture. They're a spiritual picture of a physical truth. The Israel, the Israelites, are a picture of everyone who puts their faith in God himself. Everyone who puts their faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Israel is simply a physical picture of a spiritual truth. It's God's redeemed people. So he builds all this up, and he comes to this crescendo. He comes to this peak, and he says, but forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm about to do. He says, all those things that I've done for you in the past, all those things that I've done for you that you don't even know that I've done for you, all those terrible things that you've done to me, all those terrible things that maybe you didn't know that I knew you did, he says, forget all of that. It's nothing compared to what I'm about to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will make it. Uh, I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. It's all that stuff. All of these things that I've done before. He said, nothing compared to what I am going to do. He says, I'm about to make a, a, a pathway right through the wilderness area in your life. I'm going to cut a pathway right through them. You just keep walking, I'll keep cutting down the trees. Those dry areas you like, I'm going to bring water to them. I'm going to give them life. I'm going to bring life to some areas of your life that you already thought were dead. We look around the Odyssey Church, we see that. There's people that are coming to the Odyssey Church now that weren't even going to church six months ago. We have volunteers in this church that never thought six months ago that they were going to be involved in a church, let alone volunteering in a church. God loves us so much. He, he just comes to us and he, and he says, all these things that you, you know that I've done, he goes, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. There's people in here right now today that you're just on the verge of the abundant life. God's just about to do this. In fact, he's already begun to do this new thing in your life. But in order for us to get this new thing, we have to do something new. In just the New Testament alone, in the New Living Translation, God uses the word new 162 times. 
162 times. In almost every case, either Jesus or someone else is talking about this new thing God wants to do for us. So I'm about to do something new. What he was talking about is I'm sending my son Jesus Christ into this world. I'm about to do something new, and you're going to be able to see it. You're going to be able to feel it. Do you perceive it? But he says in order to have this new thing, which the Apostle Paul calls a gift, there's only one requirement. It was the message of the prophets of the Old Testament. It was the message of John the Baptist when he was announcing Jesus Christ and his coming into the world to start his earthly ministry. It's the first recorded uh, message of Jesus as he come out of the desert and started his earthly ministry. It's the message Jesus told his disciples to speak when he went out two by two to spread the... And, and, and if, if every... Thing in the scriptures from the beginning to the end says this one thing that it has to be important. God has to love you so much that you won't forget it. And here it is. He says, I love you. And I want you to stop doing the things that you know are wrong. And I want you to start doing the things you know are right. God says, I love you. I love you. I love you. So quit living for this world and start living for my world. Now, usually we translate it something like this. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But repent simply means change the way you think so you change the way you act. Stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about God. Stop loving yourself so much and start loving your neighbor and loving God more. All through the scriptures, from the very beginning to the very end, God is telling you, I love you so much. I love you so much. I just want you to spend all eternity with me. Now, can you imagine, can you fathom, can you even grasp a little bit of that in your heart? But we have to quit living for ourselves and start living for him. In other words, we've got to stop trusting in ourselves and stop trusting in our things and stop trusting in our power and start trusting in God and start trusting in his things and start trusting in his power. But the first thing that happens, when you change the way you think, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is what happens. You get a new life. We get this new life because we have this new relationship with God. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in Corinth, he, he told them anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has become. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul tells us that when we're separated from God because of our sin, and he said we're not just separated, we're actually alienated from God. He says before you come to Jesus... There's, there's, this, there's this gap, there's this, this chasm that you can't cross. That you're separated from me. You're as if you're alien. You're alienated from me. The Apostle Paul was right to Christians in Ephesus. Or in, a, in Ephesus. He said, we're excluded. We're, we're without hope. We're without God in this world. But Paul writes another line. Paul, Paul in his letter, he said, When we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, God takes away all of our sins. He takes away the one thing that separated us from God. And he says, I don't take care of it just part of the way. I don't just take part of your sins. I just don't take the bad ones or the little ones away. I take all of them away. You're no longer without hope. You're no longer without me. You're no longer without God. The one thing which separated you, which was your sins, they've been removed. Every one of them. And now you've been reconciled. You've been made, made right with God himself. And that, that through the blood of Christ, you are holy and you stand in the presence of a holy God. When you let Jesus to be Lord of your life, you can now stand in front of a holy God, not in your own righteousness, but in his righteousness. You're no longer God's enemy. In fact, he says, not only are you no longer my enemy, God now begins to call you his friend. The Apostle Paul says, since you have now been justified through faith, you can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we use these church terms sometimes, and, and we don't always know what they mean. One way to remember what justified means is just as if it never happened. God says, those sins, those things that took you away from me and separated, I've taken them away just as if they've never happened. Just as if they were never there at all. And when you know your sins are just as if they've never happened, when you know your sins are justified, when you, you can have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And when you have a peace that passes all understanding, 
you can live life and you can live it more abundantly. But he goes on to say, you're not just my friends. He's on up. He says, when God does this new thing in our life, when we get this new life, we're born again. Not only are we his friends, we become his children. Paul says we've been adopted. We no longer have to call God this far out God. In fact, he's so close to us. Paul says, call him Abba. Call him Daddy. Look in our lives over Jesus. He's adopted us. God has adopted us into his family. And we're adopted in his family. We have a new citizenship. He's now your loving father. And you're now his child. You're spiritually born into the family. You become a new citizen of all your heavenly father's country. You have a new thing. You have a new family. You have a new heavenly father. You have a new citizenship. And God desires to do this new thing in your life. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of all of God's glory. But if we share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. He says we have a new father. We have a new heavenly father. We have a new family. We have a new citizenship. Then Jesus says in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 12, All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God. The new doors that come from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. We become a new citizen. We become a new family. We have a new heavenly father. I got friends of mine that are, are looking to adopt an overseas child looking to uh, adopt a child from a third world country. Now when they adopt this child, it's the same thing sort of happens. They have their biological father in this other country, but now they have a new father, an adopted father. They had their family in their old country, now they have a new family in this country. They had their citizenship in the old country, but now they have a new citizenship in our country. That's what God's saying. It's the same way when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. We have our biological family, but now we have an earthly family. I and mean, we have an earthly family, but now we have a heavenly father, and now we're members of the family of God. And God gives us this new family to, to help us be accountable, help hold us accountable, and we hold them up. It makes us even stronger than we were before. You're not just related to God. You're, you're now related to other believers. Everyone who truly believes in Christ is the Son of God. As repentant sin and believe in Him, is now your spiritual brother and your spiritual sister. We're bound together in God's family. Not by an organization, not by a church, not even by the Odyssey Church, but by a spiritual relationship. We're told we're members of God's household. The most frequent term used in the Bible for Christians is brothers. It just shows us it, and it underlines our family relationship. But you can't stay in the past to get this new life. When you commit your life to Christ, He wants you to make a, a new, make you a new citizen. You're still a citizen of, of this particular country. You're still a citizen of the United States, but now you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're, you're, you're now a citizen of this new city that Jesus talks about. As long as we live on earth, we possess a dual citizenship. On one hand, we have the allegiance to our nation, and we're called to be good citizens of the United States, but we're also citizens of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of which Christ is the head of. Our loyalty, though, is to Him. If somebody tells us to do something that goes against God's word, the book of Acts in chapter 5, verse 29 says, we must obey God rather than men. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the Apostle John tells us that the Bible reminds us that one day this world is going to be gone anyway. One day everything we see is going to be gone. This whole earth and everything on it is going to become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. In the very first sermon that's recorded for us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, Jesus declares, the time has come, He said, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. See, what Jesus is doing, he's making it clear that this isn't an earthly kingdom. It's not a political kingdom. It's a heavenly, spiritual kingdom. 
where God rules over everything. And Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven when we make a decision to let Jesus rule over our lives. We have this new thing. We have this new joy because we know we're living for our new family, the family of God. And we have this new citizenship that's in heaven and there's no longer something that's material and that's going to go away. We're now living for something that's eternal and will last forever. When you have that kind of joy, when you have that kind of joy, when we aren't dwelling on our past, but we're looking towards the future, that joy means we can live life and we can live it more abundantly. But not only do we have a new life and a new heavenly father and a new family and a new citizen, citizenship, when we come to Jesus Christ, we now have a new purpose. Little by little, we begin to have a desire to live for Christ. It doesn't happen overnight, but little by little. First day, it may not be much. Second day, it might be a little bit more. But before long, you're living for the living Christ. Because we know we're created by God, and we know we're created for God, and we know we're created for His glory and His purposes. We're created to glorify God in every single thing we do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes as he's writing to the Corinthian Christians, he said, Jesus died for everyone so that those who receive His new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. We begin to know that our purpose is to live for Him who has died for us and was raised again. If you really think about it, if He died for us, if we truly get to the point where we believe that Jesus Christ died for us, that excruciating death on the cross, the least we do is to live for Him. God wants, He desires to do this new thing in your life and in my life, to give us a new life, to give us a new Heavenly Father, to give us a new citizenship, to give us a new purpose. And when God does this new thing, we know what our purpose is. We set up, we make up our minds about the purpose, about the direction we're going to go in, how we're going to fulfill that purpose and that God has created for. And when He does this, God gives us a new power to accomplish it. One of the Bible's most comforting truths, one of the things that brings me the greatest comfort, when we choose to come to Christ, when we choose to make Jesus Lord and Savior of our life, God Himself becomes alive in us. Paul assures us of this. The book of Romans, which, which, which I believe, and many others believe, and I hope one day, if you don't believe, you will believe, that, that the Bible is inspired by God, inspired as God breathed, that God actually breathed the words and used man and his experience to write them. But, but it says in the book of Romans, written by Paul, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. Now that's a power I desire to have. A power that is so strong that it can actually raise up people who are dead. Paul says, when you take Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. And we don't have to go it alone. And what that means is... Uh, there's somebody to help us along the way. We, we have a comfort. We have an advocate. We have a power, a new power behind us to help us get through these tough times. In that same chapter of Romans, chapter 8, Paul says, You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Sometimes that Spirit we talk about is our conscience. God's helping us along. He's saying, That's not right. You ought not do that. And I can help you not to do it. Or the opposite. You know you ought to do this over here, right? I'm going to give you power to help you get through it. I'm going to give you power to help you do it. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. And if you know Jesus Christ, you don't have to beg the Holy Spirit to come in your life. He's already there. One of the greatest lessons that I had to learn as a young Christian is whether I feel His power or whether I don't feel His power, His power is there. I can feel His presence. And there's other times when not so much. God allows me to have a dry period so I can appreciate the wet period. 
but he comes in. And whether I feel him or not, the scripture says he's always there. We don't have to beg him there because he's already there. The Holy Spirit knows our purpose and helps us get through whatever it is we need to go through. He helps us go in our new direction. God has given us a new power to achieve the things that he wants us to do. God wants to do a new thing in our life. He wants to give you a new life. He wants to give you a new family. He wants to give you a new citizenship. He wants to give you a new purpose. He gives you new power. When we make a decision for Jesus Christ, we want to live for Christ and not just for ourselves. We begin to see people differently. Not for what they can do for us, but what we can do for them. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus promised that we'll see this new power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We aren't meant to live this Christian life in our own strength. God has provided His Holy Spirit to help us out. He gives us the power to do what He wants us to do and have what we want to have. And it gives us the power not to give up when things get tough. It's the same power that Jesus Christ received in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's amazing what you can do when you know your purpose and you set the direction of your life towards that purpose. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, and don't give up when things get tough. No. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is praying to his Father. He knew the next day he was going to be executed. He was to go to the cross. What if Jesus gave up simply because it was getting tough? It was getting too hard. He didn't want to go through it. No, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, Shall I not drink of the cup the Father has given me? The Holy Spirit gave Jesus the power to say, I'm not going to quit now just because it's going to hurt. I'm not going to quit now just because things are starting to get tough. This is the purpose I came for. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to press through. I'm going to finish the job. We have to do the same thing. We have to make up our minds that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to finish what we started. Because you have no idea what God can do through you if you don't give up, if you just hang in there until the job is done. When we ask Jesus in the heart, when we repent of our sins and put our past behind us, God gives us these new things. He gives us this new life. He gives us this new relationship with Him. He gives us our new family. He gives us a new citizenship into the kingdom of God. He gives us this new purpose and this new power. And we go into a new direction. And when you go into a new direction, you get a brand new destiny. When somebody makes Jesus the Lord and Savior, we say they've been converted. Maybe some of you have heard that term before. The word conversion means to change. And when we come to Christ, God gives us a new direction. He changes us. When we change and we go to a new direction, we get a new destiny. Come to Christ, God gives us a new direction with a new destiny. Once we were headed for hell, now we're headed for heaven. Once we were bound for eternal separation from God, and now we're going to live with Him forever. Once we had no hope of eternal life, but now we do. Bible says in Romans chapter 23, written by Paul, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to notice Paul says it's a gift. Eternal life is a gift from God. There's so many people I think they have to earn their salvation by their own good works. But you can never, ever, ever be good enough to earn your way into heaven because God's standard is perfection. Our only hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ who purchased our salvation at the cost of his own blood. And now he offers it to us as a free gift. We have to be willing to accept the gift, but to reach out our hands and grab it. The Apostle Peter wrote in his first letter what we call 1 Peter in chapter 1 through the, again the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He tells us, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. We have new life, a new birth through a new relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, what a gift. When you can have that assurance, when you have the assurance of eternal life with Christ, you can now live life. You can live it more abundantly. Because you know, you know 
No longer is your treasure in things that are going to perish and fade away. But they're stored up in heaven where moth and dust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. God wants to do this new thing in your life. Can you feel it? Can you see it? He wants to make paths where there's no paths. He wants to bring light where there's no light. He wants to give you a whole new thing. He wants to give you a whole new journey. A new odyssey, if you will. A whole new path to follow until the day He takes us up into heaven to be with Him. And when you hear all this, when you hear things like, like new destiny, new direction, new purpose, new life, new birth, new relationship, new father, new family, new history, it, it seems like God is doing a lot of new things in your life. So why does He say, I'm doing a new thing? It sounds like He's doing something horrible. And yet he speaks in the singular. He said it's already started. Can you feel it? In fact, I've already started to do it. Something brand new and it's so much greater than anything that I've ever done before. You can't even begin to compare it. So what is this new thing? This new thing is a brand new you. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ can become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. God's done a new thing. You've been born again. There's a brand new you. You're a new person with a new life. And your old life is gone. God says, you know all them good things I've done for you in the past, and even those good things I've done for you that you don't even know about, and all those terrible things you've done to me that you didn't think I knew about? Forget about all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm about to do. For I'm about to do something in your life. I'm getting ready to do something new. It's already begun. Don't you see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry land. If you just simply put your trust in my son, Jesus Christ, I will make you a brand new you. In other words, your decision for Christ isn't an end, but it's a beginning. The beginning of a brand new thing, a brand new, more abundant life. We aren't only called to become Christians. We are called to be Christian. You're a new you. Don't ever think that faith in Christ is, is just some type of spiritual life insurance that you, you sign the back of a card or you come to an altar or you repeat a prayer. It's not what he's talking about. It's not something we get and then put away until we need it to get into heaven. It's so much more than that. The Christian life is a brand new thing. It's a brand new journey, a brand new odyssey. One that will take you the rest of your life to get. And the best thing is... We never have to walk it alone. Christ walks it with us. And Jesus, he so desires, he so desires that we remember what it costs him to give us this new life. Jesus gave us a way to remember this new thing. He died and he lived and he rose again to give us a new thing. And he gives us a way to remember it. It's called a new covenant. After the supper, he took a cup of wine and said, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed in my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice to you. The Lord invites you to come and dine with him, to come and sup with him, to drink with him at his table. Remember the new thing he desired each one of us to have. All who love him, all who have repented their sin and seek to live in peace with one another are invited to sit at his table. It's, so, it's overwhelming at times. Not, not only does God give us a new life because of a new relationship with him, not only does he give us this new family and this new citizenship into his kingdom, he gives us a new purpose, he gives us new power, he gives us new direction with a new destiny and a new journey. He gives us a totally new us. God gives us a new covenant so we can know what he's done, a new thing in life. It's a brand new you and he wants you to remember it so bad. He wants you to remember that it was sealed this new covenant in his blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So this morning we're going to take communion by intention. That simply means you'll be given the bread, which is, represents the body of Christ given for you. And then you're going to dip the bread into the juice representing the body of Christ poured out for you. And then if you desire, come to the altars and spend some time with God.
The altar is open to all who believe, for taking the bread and the juice, and then as many of you who desire to come to the altar, give thanks, bring a request, and maybe for some of you today is the day of your salvation. Maybe to God today has given you a brand new you. After you take the elements, again, you can spend time with God the altar. This is not something to do is something to cherish, something to enjoy, something to see what God has done in your life and remember what He's done for you. And if you're not able to come up to us, we'll come to you. And after you're done with the elements, just spend time with God as you see fit and then return to your chair. You'll come up the uh, center aisle, you'll go back down through the side aisle. The Lord invites you, all of those who Seek to have peace with others and accept in Christ to remember what he has done. This is a celebration of a new covenant that God has affirmed with the very blood of his son. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to the Father, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ given for you. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. Everyone who desires to come to God's table, the table is now open. Isn't it amazing? We make Jesus not only our Savior, but our Lord. God gives us this new relationship with Him. Sinful man now can come into the presence of a holy God. He makes us his children. He gives us new life through a new relationship with him. He gives us a new family, a new citizenship. He gives us new purpose and a new direction so that we have a new destiny. He gives us this new power. In fact, he gives you a brand new you through a brand new covenant. He gives us his peace. He gives us his joy. He gives us his hope. He gives us his assurance. And if there's a brand new you and you have all those things in your life, you have to know you're living life and you're living it more abundantly. Allow me to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done, for all that you're going to do. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be a brand new us through your power, through your, through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we have a new covenant to show, sealed in his blood, of what you're going to do. You've already begun. Lord, you just simply ask, can we feel it? Can we see it? Lord, we just pray today that as we go out into this world, that others can see the new us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So as you heard uh, earlier today, your homework assignment was given to you very early. Bring somebody back with you next week. Come and get free food. Come in and enjoy Memorial Day. Come in here, Tom and Debbie Slaughter. I want to remind you that we're going to have food, we're going to have drinks, we're going to have some unities, that we are going to celebrate as the body of Christ, as the family of God, and the family of the Odyssey Church. Go forth in the peace and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. May it be all with you. And as you leave here today, Remember the new thing that God has done in your life. Remember the new thing that God has given you and remember to serve God and serve others and to glorify Him in all that you do. 
You are a brand new you. Go live like it and live it more abundantly. Amen? Amen. You are dismissed.